Hi, I'm Sakali, and welcome back to another episode of Falcon Notes. Now, today we're going to be going over the Unit 2 of AP Human Geography, which um, happens to be population. We're going to be going over some vocabulary and key concepts that we learned in class, such as population growth and distribution. There's also population density. I forgot to say that. Now, to begin, to begin, there are two types of population growth. There is linear growth, which is uh, defined as an arithmetic growth, or it grows at a constant rate. We've all seen linear graphs if we've taken algebra one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the other type of growth is exponential growth, which is a lot different than linear because it is more geometric and the con the rate at which it grows is always either doubling. The world that we live in, though, grows at an exponential rate. Now, the next thing we learned is doubling time. Doubling time, for example, is the time it takes for a population to double. It's not that hard to figure it out. This is an estimated time based on the current population growth. So let's say it takes five years for something to double. That means that their growth rate is a lot that's really big if it doubles in five years. Or they just don't have a lot of people. But yeah. A population explosion is a sudden burst in the population in either a certain geographical area or worldwide. Many different, many different factors contribute to population growth. For starters, there is natural increase, which is the overall growth of a population, or births minus deaths. Crude birth rate is births per year per thousand of people. Crude death rate is the same, except with deaths, so deaths per year per thousand people. Now, the rate of natural increase is the percentage in which a population grows. For example, the initial population is 100, and the population grows 3, so the po new population is 103. Therefore, the population grew 3% from 100. <laughs> Total fertility rate is the average number of children born to a woman during her childbearing years. In the U.S., it's below 2.1, and much of Africa it is above 4. In South America, it is between 2 and 3, and in Europe, it is below 2.1. China and Russia, it is both below 2.1, and in the Middle East, it's above 4. This can give an estimate of how our world grows, how our population grows, and where they grow. Infant mortality rate is how many infants under 1 year old live out of 100. You can tell by this number that if there's a lot of deaths of infants, then it's probably a least developed country because they don't have enough technology or health to keep the baby alive. Um, so this really shows, this can really show how um, developed a country is. Now child mortality rate is the same thing. It's very similar to infant mortality rate. However, it is the annual number of deaths of children under five compared to one per thousand deaths. Maternal mortality rate is the number of deaths per 1,000 women during childbirth. Now these three statistics can define how healthy and how advanced a country is. Say there is a high infant mortality rate, it means that technology and health are probably lower. Dependency ratio is also a very important term when it comes to population. The dependence ratio, as said in the study guide, is the number of people who are too young or too old to work compared to the number of people in their productive years. This is important because this tells how many people each worker support, supports. For example, the larger, pro the larger population of dependents, the greater financial burden on those who are working to support those who cannot. A big part of our population is density and population distribution. Ecumen is the proportion of the Earth's surface occupied by humans. This gives us an example of where we're using most of our land and just, just a basic overview of where our populations live. There are a few types of population density. Arithmetic density is the total population of humans divided by total land area. It shows how much space one human can take up on our globe. Physiological density is the total population divided by total uh, arable, arable land or the land that is used for agriculture which shows that 
It shows all the space that one human can take up of farmland. Now, so when we talk about population distributions, we can see that humans are distributed everywhere around the globe. No matter what, they're all in different places and stuff like that. The three main properties of distribution is density, concentration, and pattern. We spend a couple of days on population pyramids and generations. Now population pyramids definition is the population displayed by age and gender on a bar graph. So I'll put up a picture right now. You guys can see that. Population structure, composition or distribution is two back to back bar graphs. One showing the number of males and one showing females in a particular population in five year groups. This is important because you can tell from the age distribution important important characteristics of a country whether high guest worker population they just had a war or a deadly disease or more. That's basically what a population pyramid is. A cohort is populations of various age categories in a population pyramid. This is important because this can tell what what state state this country it is whether in stage 3 or stage 5 in the demographic transition model. So now in US population, we talked about baby booms and baby busts. A baby boom is people born in between uh, 1946 and 1964. It's a post-war after I think uh, the World War II where there were a lot of babies born because people were happy that the war had ended. Baby bust is period during in the US during the 1960s and 1970s where fertility rates just dropped as many female baby boomers sought higher education and jobs. Hmm. Generation X is people born in between in the US between 1965 and 1980. Uh, they have the burden of supporting the baby boom cohort as they head into retirement. Generation Y is people born between 1980 and 2001, also referred to as echo boomers or millennials as we know today. Now, <clears throat> demographic transition model is very important when we talk about this. There are five steps to the demographic transition model. I'm stupid. There are four steps, sorry, four steps in the demographic transition model. This is a um, graph that shows um, population growth and like where we think we're going in the population. So it has four steps, like I said. Stage one is low growth, so low population, like small populations. Stage two is high growth, so when they start gaining speed in a exponential graph. Stage three is moderate growth, so this, this is after they're all at a high level, so they made a big population, and now it's starting to lower down. And stage four is low growth, which means that they're probably going to start dropping in numbers stage five i was right there are five stages although not officially a stage is a possible stage that includes zero or negative population growth this is important because this is the way our country and other countries around the world are transformed for, from a less developed country to a more developed country now we also talked about population policies population policies are put in place by the government to either increase population or decrease population depending on the country's situation. Now expansive or pronatalist countries are the ones that want to get bigger in population. An example of this is Russia. They have a national day of conceiving and stuff like that. They really want to grow their population because Russia has a pretty small population. Now restrictive population or anti-natalist countries are the ones that want to slow down population growth because their population is too high. Like say China or India, they have very big populations and they really probably want to get rid of those so they don't overpopulate. Overpopulation is relationship between the number of people on earth and the available resources. So if we overpopulate with not enough resources, there's going to be a lot of people that are hungry and they don't have any places to stay because well the resources are used by other people on the planet so 
Yeah, overpopulation is not good. Underpopulation is the opposite of overpopulation and refers to a sharp drop or decrease in a re region's population. Now talking about over overpopulation and underpopulation, there's also a carrying capacity. This is a population level that can be supported like perfectly and it can't go over the population or else there's not enough food for everybody. So there is only a certain space that the earth can carry which is called carrying capacity. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the definition. This is the population level that can be supported given the quantity of food, habitat, water, and other life infrastructures present. This is important because it tells how many people in an area will be able to support. That's what I said. Now we go over to Thomas Malthus, a man that we talked about in pretty pretty big. Uh, we talked about Thomas Malthus quite a bit. So Thomas Malthus believed that food food growth and food is linear while population growth is exponential <laughs> he will always believe that there will be overpopulation because of this that po uh, exponential graphs are grow a lot faster than food because food is linear and population will grow f a lot faster than food so there's not going to be enough food for everybody however he, he was wrong because we're here today <laughs> We move on to population theorist, the biggest one, Thomas Malthus. After which we go to Bosrup, a human growth. Uh, he believed that human growth stimulates agriculture intensive. Okay, he believed that human growth stimulates as agriculture intensifies. So Malthus is upside down. He believes the exact opposite. Marx was an anti-capitalist that believed that lack of food is due to unequal distribution and human growth is not the problem. Cornico the cornucopian theory, cornucopian, yeah, theory. Earth has an abundance of resources and can never be used up, which is really, really stupid, but... Okay, Malthusian is the theory that built upon, that was built upon Malthus's thought of overpopulation. It takes, into, it takes into account two factors that Malthus did not, population growth in lower developed countries and outstripping of resources other than food. Okay, after population theorist, we move on to types and reasons for mi migration. There are a whole bunch of different migration types, like step migration, which is migration to a destiny that occurs in steps. So you might want to go to New York from Washington and you stop by in certain places along the way, so that's step population. Chain population occurs, er, what the heck? Step migration, sorry. Chain migration is what is, occurs when one family member or friend uh, follows a migratory path, and then a friend or family of, an, of the existing community, oh shoot. Chain migration occurs when one individuals follow the migratory path of preceding friends or families into an existing community. So basically what this means is that if one person goes and migrates, then one of their friends or one of their family members migrates too. Now intervening opportunity is the presence of a near opportunity that greatly diminishes the act attractiveness of sites that are far away. So like saying, going back to the Washington, New York thing, if you stop by, if you want to go to New York and you're in Washington, but you stop by in the middle, say, Las Vegas, I guess, you don't really want to go to New York anymore because, like, Las Vegas is fine and New York is far away. Now, voluntary migration is movement in which people relocate in response to perceived opportunity. Forced migration is when people are moved from their countries or states through force, like slaves, like the Atlantic slave trade or the Jewish diaspora. Now, counter migration is when people are migrated back to where they uh, to where they left because for the United States, they will send people back if they don't have citizenship or a green card or anything like that. Now, cyclic movement is movement that has a closed route and is repeated annually or seasonally. Now, there are two factors that make people want to migrate. There are push and pull factors. Now, push factors are things that are making them not like the place that they live in, making them want to migrate somewhere. So things like this are harsh climates or economic recessions or political turmoil. Pull factors are attractions that draw 
tourists or people that want to live to a certain place. So like pleasant climate or employment or education. So people would rather go move there than live where they are right now. Now catalyst of migration are economic conditions, political circumstances, armed conflict and civil war, environmental conditions, cultural, culture and traditions, technological advances and flow of information through technology. Now some theories and patterns of migration. So the laws of migration was made in 1885 by Ernst Ravenstein. Um, and he believed in five things. That net migration amounts to a fraction of the gross migration. The majority of migrants move a short distance. Migrants who move longer distances tend to choose big cities. Urban residents are less migratory than inhabitants of rural areas. And families are less likely to make international moves than young adults. The gravity model predicts that the optimal location of a service is directly related to the number of people in an area and inversely related to the people must travel to access it. <coughs> Another aspect of migration are refugees, or people who leave their home because they are forced out. They're not really officially relocated, but they want to move out for their safety. So like Nazis forcing Jews into the ghettos or they're enslaved. Most refugees move w without any more tangible property than what they can carry or transport with them because they really don't have space to carry anything else with them. You guys probably know what international and national are, but international is crossed an international boundary during dislocation. Now there are also migra migration patterns like intercontinental permanent movement from one country to another country on the same continent interregional permanent movement from one region to a, of from one region region of a country to another and rural urban permanent movement from suburbs and rural areas to the urban city area so there you guys have it that's all you need to know about theories patterns of migration well there you have it folks that's gonna wrap up this video uh, unit 2 of population if you guys like the video please hit the like button and the subscribe button if you think that these were helpful to you. Again, thank you so much for watching. If you guys want to see Unit 3, keep watching. And I'll see you guys next time.